Bueno, el señor Lynch está aquí fuera escuchando para hacer mucho más uh, atractiva su llegada. En el momento en el que yo acabe de hablar, por favor, os incito a todos a recibirlo con un fortísimo aplauso. Uh, estimados miembros del Festival Rizoma, estimados miembros de la Fundación David Lynch, estimados compañeros del área de comunicación audiovisual, gracias por hacer posible el encuentro de hoy. Si me permiten, y por deferencia al señor Lynch, voy a continuar en inglés. Members of David Lynch Foundation, members of Rizoma Festival, colleagues of Media Studies Area, thank you very much for making this talk possible today. There are students, there are professors, university staff. Thank you for, for your attendance. Mr. Lynch, thank you very much for choosing our public university, Carlos III of Madrid, for your encounter with the Spanish university students. For us, that we are living turbulent times in our country, your decision to come here during your visit to Rizoma Festival in Madrid is really very, very important. We will never forget that Mr. Lynch, an unparalleled artist and filmmaker who we respect so much, came to our home to talk about meditation, creativity, peace. Please, everyone, remember the format of this presentation. Mr. Lynch is going to give us a brief talk, and after that, we can make any comments or ask any questions to him in an informal way. We have two people with microphones in the room ready for your interventions. Mr. Lynch, thank you, thank you very much for coming. Time, our time is yours now. Buenos dias, everybody. Buenos dias. I'd like to, I'm very happy to be here to your university, and I'd like to take uh, questions and try to answer those questions so I know what you want to hear about. So we could start with um, the first question. Yes. You need a microphone. Uh, hi, David. Hello. Hello. Uh, 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 first of all, thank you so much for being here. Um, I would like to make you two questions. First question is, uh, you are speaking that you don't need to suffer to uh, do, to, to, you don't need to, to suffer to do things or to create things with suffer. So, uh, in history, a lot of directors, writers, or um, artists uh, we know that speak about dark or suffer or things like that, they look like sad, I don't know, it's like poor rats, uh, or people like that, or they take drugs, or they... I, I'm not sure if it's like your face and your eyes project light. So it's like I don't understand if um, you are like that because of doing meditation. And I don't know if you want to respond or I... I sure, 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 I'll respond. I say that the artist doesn't have to suffer to show suffering. You have to understand the suffering, understand the human condition, but you yourself don't have to suffer to show suffering. 
and you don't have to die to film a death scene. You just have to understand it. And the more happiness and uh, all this from within that you have, the more fun you have telling stories. And stories throughout time have huge contrast, life and death situations, torment, lots of negativity, and lots of beautiful things as well. So um, there's a lot of artists that are suffering and still do great work, but um, it's a real sadness uh, that they don't really enjoy the doing is so much. There's lots of anger in a lot of artists, lots of depression, lots of suffering, and it doesn't need to be that way. When you get this technique of transcendental meditation uh, to dive within, experience the big treasury within, unfold that, it gets so much fun to be alive, so much fun to create. More energy, more intelligence comes, more creativity, more love. Things get very, very, very good. And you can still tell um, fantastic stories, but really enjoy the doing. And my second question is, uh, when you do meditation, you are in, like in another level of consciousness? Not necessarily. Or Okay, okay, but because my question was that, do you think when we lost our body, uh, something will steal some energy or something like that? They say that, well, this treasury within is got, has got many, many names. One of the names is ocean of pure fullness of bliss consciousness. And consciousness is the number one ingredient. People don't really talk about consciousness. You don't hear about consciousness on the television. You just hear about the financial crises and the um, problems of America right now with these politicians. But consciousness is something so fantastic. Consciousness is really life itself. Consciousness is the I amness of life. We can only say I am because of consciousness. And tied to consciousness are all these all positive qualities. So in this ocean within is, which is unbounded, infinite, eternal, immortal, immutable. Always been there, always will be there. And you can experience that with a technique to really truly get yourself there, when you experience it, it's so sublime. Every time you experience it, you infuse some, you start expanding that consciousness and those all positive qualities of intelligence. So within all of us, unbounded intelligence, unbounded creativity, unbounded happiness, unbounded love, unbounded energy, unbounded peace within each one of us. And this consciousness is it alone is it always will be so when you die you just drop the body consciousness continues it's a transition a transformation but uh, we can get into what you know goes on but there's not much to worry about it's like um, a driver who gets a new car you get in the car you drive the car enjoy the car the car gets old and it stops running, and then the driver gets out of the car. The driver gets a new car. It's like that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi, Mr. Lintz. Uh, I would like to ask uh, if meditation and creativity go side by side from your point of view, uh, which has been your deepest uh, meditation link to, to, to creativity? I found, um, for you know, like I've told this story a bunch, um, when the Beatles went with Maharishi, um, I thought that was very nice, but I thought meditation was a complete waste of time. I wasn't interested in it at all. And um, I heard this phrase, true happiness is not out there, true happiness lies within. And this phrase had a ring of truth to it. And, but they don't tell you where the within is, nor do they tell you how to get there. So one day I thought maybe 
the Beatles are into something that's, that's this way, this meditation is a way to go within and find that happiness. So I started looking into many different types of meditation, finally found Transcendental Meditation, and my experience has been that before I was filled with this anger and a kind of depression and lots and lots of anxieties and looking back a kind of a weakness, not self-assured. So this is not a great way to go forward. I didn't really know I was that way, but looking back I see that I was. So I found out that I got the anger li lifted and I got happier from the inside. It's really true, this happiness comes out. Life, the world looks better and better and ideas seem to flow more. And with it, so much energy to do the work. So happiness in the doing, a flow of creativity, a flow of ideas that serves the work. And people start looking better and better and better. And, and I think one day, pretty soon, we'll see that we can travel anywhere and meet friends, not enemies. We're a world family. There's tons of creativity there waiting for us within. Tons of energy, tons of intelligence, tons of love, universal love, an unbounded ocean of it within. All these things serve the work and serve the life. And it's, it's, it's really, really beautiful. And it doesn't mean that you're gonna do goody, goody, two-shoes films or any, any kind of um, pretty little paintings. It means that you'll be able to really fulfill your desires and obstacles will be less and less and less. The secret to the real good life lies within. And just another short question, we're in Spain. And I would like to know what has been the influence, if it has some influence in your work, the, the paintings of surrealistic masters like Dali or films of Buñuel. I didn't really get into Buñuel or the surrealists really, but um, for some reason um, people connect me with the surrealists in some ways. The world is... Um, filled with uh, strange things and absurdities and humor and sadness and romance and all these things, I get these ideas coming from the world and suddenly one idea comes that I fall in love with. And I fall in love with the ideas for two reasons. One, the idea itself, and the second reason, the way cinema can translate that idea. So it's a cinema, it's exciting to me in a cinematic way, and the idea itself is exciting. So some of these ideas I fall in love with, who knows why, are um, in a little bit of a surreal world. We have a question over here. Yes, where is that coming from? Okay. Hi. Here. Thank you very much for being here, first of all. And I wanted to ask two questions, one related with the previous one. The first one is, uh, you're speaking about meditation and the inner world and uh, that kind of things. And I think that you're giving a very optimistic impression uh, of that uh, in this, in this uh, conference. But in your films, it, that vision of the, um, of the subconscious and stuff is more um, repressive and more obscure. I wanted to know why. Those are the ideas I fell in love with. I always say stories, like I said, are always going to be stories, stories, stories throughout time. And stories hold contrast. A story that didn't have, you know, the uh, suffering and human condition and overcoming things and all the things of life, they wouldn't be gr uh, great stories. So the, the trick is to um, be able to tell these stories possibly holding great suffering but you yourself don't have to suffer. And I'm gonna fall in love with certain ideas and you're gonna fall in love with different ideas. The, the, the great thing is you should be able to realize your ideas in freedom and with total control and happiness in the doing, no matter what it is. And the same thing should go for me. Um, the second question was uh, about, it, it, it has to do about, uh, with the influences 
that they were asking before about Buñuel and Dali. So what do you think are your influences of your, the influences of in your cinema, if they are not so much like surrealistic uh, Buñuel and stuff? Well, I always say um, that the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is my greatest influence. <laughs> okay. Um, we've heard a lot of actors. Um, a lot of what? A lot of actors dedicating their performances to directors. We've seen. Um, Actors give amazing performances, and then later explaining that direct that the director really helped them get there. And so I was wondering, as a director, when you're looking for a specific type of performance, whether it's a crying scene or intense laughing scene, and your actor is not getting there emotionally, how do you usually? What tool do you usually use to help them get there? Okay, um, uh, I believe that. Um, Actors need a safe place. Uh, you hear stories of directors um, uh, screaming at people or humiliating somebody to get a performance. I don't really believe in that. I believe in, in rehearsing a little bit. Sometimes some people like to rehearse a little bit more. And rehearsing is a, a way I you try to get the actors to get along the same line as the ideas dictate. So a first rehearsal, you see, you have a rehearsal and you see how close or how far it is away from uh, the ideas, the road you're traveling. And if it's far away, no problem, you just go and you talk and you talk with words. And you say these words and the actors are listening and then you have another rehearsal and it's usually closer, but maybe it's not quite there yet. So you go and you use words and you talk a little bit and you watch their faces and then you have an, and they're nodding, you have another rehearsal, now it's very, very close, but it's not still quite there. So you say a few more words and one of these times, click, it pops and they catch this thing. And from then on, they're rolling down the same road that these ideas are indicating, and they own that character. And then the trick is for them to make it real on a deep level. The safer the set, the better the feeling on the set, the easier it is for them to go deep and get that real thing happening on a deep level. And if you um, create this space for them and and, and go in a, in a kind way, sometimes, you know, just a, one little word or one little thing, it, it, it pops and they're crying or laughing or whatever, and, they, and, it, and it clicks. It's, it's a kind of a communication in a safe spot. I have a question here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, in many of your films, uh, I perceive a message that says something like, uh, stop trying to make sense and to control everything you are seeing and just unleash your mind. Like, feel what you are looking at. Even you don't understand everything. Even it, you, don't, can, you cannot control everything you are looking at. So my question is, Mm, what do you think about the, um, the subconscious and the, and the, um, sorry, I forget the word. That's okay. Uh, well, about the subconscious itself, like the mystery of the subconscious in relation with your artwork. Uh -huh, that's a good question. Um, I fall in love a lot with stories that have, I say, concrete things and abstract things and cinema can say both those things. So when things get abstract, uh, it, it needs to kick in uh, the intuition. And to me, intuition is feel thinking. Sometimes these things in life that we feel, uh, it's difficult to put in words. And so, but we know them, but they're, they're, it's through intuition. 
And this thing of intuition is like a knowingness. So you can be seeing things and hearing things that are very abstract, but they're still talking to you, but the way to interpret it is through intuition. It's not an intellectual thing, or it's not just an emotional thing, it's both those things writing together. Uh, I would like to thank you for being here too. And the question is, uh, do, you th do, do you believe in this inspiration that you find any day, suddenly you find the muses, or do you think that the hard work, the inspiration, the, uh, the, the hard work, the meditation will bring you that great story you want to tell? Okay, um, they say the ideas are out there, and I say they're like little fish, or sometimes big fish, and the trick is to catch them. So I say that people, it's just like fishing, you need patience. And I say a desire for an idea is like a bait on a hook. So you could sit in a chair and it's sort of like daydreaming. You're, you're, or you could picture yourself sitting in a boat with a line in the water. You're daydreaming, you're desiring an idea and you're going through all these different things ideas are coming but now they none of them are you're falling in love with and then suddenly not all the time but on a good beautiful moment you catch this idea that you fall in love with and this is the way it goes for me and that idea may not be may just be a fraction a tiny fraction of the story that's out there but this tiny fraction you fall in love with so much It could be an idea of a, of a certain look, of a certain face, in a certain mood, but it indicates a whole new kind of thing to you, and you love this. And this thing that came to you, this moment, you write it down in a, such a way that when you read it again, that same thing will come back. So it's very important to write it down. Now you have this thing that you caught, and you think about that, and it's even more beautiful bait on the hook. You're thinking about that, and more often than not, other ideas will swim in and hook onto it, and a thing will start emerging. That's the way it works for me. Over here. Thank you very much for coming. Thank uh, you. My question will be, in a creation process, when you're doing a film like Mulholland Drive, uh -huh. which is more important for you, uh, the emotion and feelings you are transmitting to the audience, or the conflicts and the storyline you are carrying your characters through? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, you're more concerned about what the audience is getting? I'm never thinking about the audience. No. No. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> That's the kiss of death. Um, uh, you think about the audience, you'll go crazy because people are all different on the surface, all different kind of people. You think about the idea that came to you and the ideas, let's say you don't have any ideas, but someone gives you a script. Someone gives you a script and when you read the script, as we all know, the thing starts coming alive in your mind and that's like ideas. So I say a script is organized ideas. You read it, it comes alive in your mind, and you feel it, and you see it, you hear it, it's coming from the page, and then you remember that, now you fall in love with this script, say. That's all it takes. The rest is being true to those, those things that came out of that script and translating that to cinema. So you're the, you're the audience and you see all these things. Now the thing is, all these elements, you try to get to be true to the thing that came alive in your mind. It's mostly common sense filmmaking. It's just common sense. You see that that thing is wrong. That thing is wrong because it doesn't jive with this. It's the wrong mood. So you go talk to that person and you tell them with words certain things so that the next thing they bring is more in line with what's in your head. So 
you stay true to the idea, you try to get all the elements, all the people on the road of that idea, and, you, and, you, and then you uh, have a chance of the whole thing holding together, and it feels right to you. And if it feels right to you, you've already won. But now you put it out in the world, and you see if it feels right for, for others. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. <laughs> if I will, I have two questions. One out of mere curiosity, and one I want answered very urgently from you. First one is, what kinds of things you, as David Lynch, what kinds of things do you dream? I don't dream so much. <laughs> really? I like to daydream. And I like to sit in a chair and daydream. And, uh, but I always say the same thing. I love dream logic. Dream logic is very beautiful to me. And it's abstract. But cinema can say this dream logic. Cinema can say it, and that's one of the most beautiful things about the language of cinema. What's the other question? The other question. It's about Mulholland Drive, concretely. Now, between you and me, <laughs> <laughs> I want a true answer. Hay banda or no hay banda? <laughs> it's the answer is maybe both. Oh my God. <laughs> I should draw a picture. If it's okay if I draw a picture? I, if I draw a picture, I think you'll understand. Um, I don't know how to set this up. This is a picture, this here, this line here represents the surface of life, the surface. And we live on the surface and we see surfaces. And let's say this side is matter. And this side is mind, mind and matter. And they say about 300 years ago, scientists started wondering, what is this stuff of matter? What is this material? What is this water? What is this glass? And they started looking into matter. And they found these things called cells. And then they found little molecules. They found atoms, and they found these little protons and electrons, and they got down farther and farther and they f to the elementary particles, the tiniest particles in manifestation, in creation. And they found four forces that act upon the particles. And on a deeper level, they saw, whoa, these four forces are now three. And on a deeper level, they saw those three become two. And in the 1970s or early 80s, modern quantum physics discovered the unified field. The unity of all the particles and all the forces of creation. And this unified field is no thing. But the scientists saw that all things come from this field of no thing, this field of unity. And this field of unified field is unmanifest. No manifestation is there. But all manifestation arises from this field. Ancient Vedic science has always and forever known about this field. And they say it is that unbounded ocean of consciousness. Unbounded, eternal, infinite 
immortal, immutable consciousness. That field that never had a beginning, it is and it will be forever. And this field of consciousness, this consciousness, as I told you, has these all positive qualities. Intelligence, creativity, happiness, love, energy, and peace. Now these scientists that discovered this, they discovered it through theory, theorems and you know, equations and whatever, they don't get to experience it. They know it's there. But any one of them or any one of us could get this technique of transcendental meditation as taught by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And transcendental meditation is a mental technique, an ancient form of meditation brought back for this time. And in Transcendental Meditation, you get a mantra. A mantra is a very specific sound, vibration, thought. And the mantra you get in Transcendental Meditation is so beautiful because it turns our awareness from out 180 degrees to within. And once you're tur tun turned within, you will naturally and easily dive through deeper levels of mind, deeper levels of intellect, and at the border of intellect, transcend and experience this unbounded ocean. And this word transcend is so important so important for the human being. Why is it easy once you're pointed within to dive? Because the human being always wants to go to fields of greater happiness. And each deeper level of mind has more happiness. Each deeper level of intellect has even more happiness. And we're here at the border, you're going to transcend because this is infinite happiness. And when you experience this, it's a sublime experience, so profoundly sublime. Unbounded awareness is there, a f waves of bliss, of happiness. Physical, emotional, mental, spiritual happiness is within every one of us. And when you experience it, you infuse it. Every human being has consciousness. This ball represents whatever size consciousness we have. Every human being has consciousness, but not every human being has the same amount. The potential for each and every one of us human beings is infinite consciousness, total supreme enlightenment. So you want to expand whatever size ball of consciousness you have. Every time you transcend, you infuse some, and this ball of consciousness you thought was just going to stay the same for the rest of your life starts expanding. And what you're doing is you're expanding consciousness and the subconscious is becoming conscious now. The subconscious is becoming conscious. And ideas that are coming up, you're gonna catch at a deeper level. We don't know any idea until it enters the conscious mind. And that's why I say they show a light bulb going on when someone gets an idea. It entered the conscious mind, boom, you see it and you know it. But if you could expand this more and more, and you're expanding these all positive qualities. So that's why I say, I, 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 no I banda or banda. This is no I banda, and this is banda. The two things together. And it's all really one. It's all really one, but you can appreciate both. And when you expand this consciousness, there's a side effect, and it's a beautiful side effect. Negativity, can you see that? Negativity begins to recede. Such a beautiful thing. The heavy weight of negativity that we live under starts lifting. Not overnight, but in time, more and more and more. So you see things like stress, and people are suffering with stress. Little kids are suffering with stress traumatic stress. People are really, lots of us human beings are suffering with traumatic stress. And they get pharmaceutical drugs, they drink, they take drugs, and it just covers the problem. It doesn't get rid of it. Anxieties. 
We all got a lot of anxieties and worries and tension. We got sorrow, depression. We got hate, anger, rage, fear. These things in the field and in, in the home of negativity start to lift away. And it's a very, very beautiful thing for, you know, living life. The things outside that used to stress you don't have the same power to stress you so much. The boss that used to give you so much trouble, he starts looking more and more like a, a brother. And pretty soon you got your arm around your boss and you're saying, let's get a cup of coffee. And it, it goes and he starts feeling better about the whole thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And in transcending, expanding consciousness, you're unfolding your full potential as a human being, as I said, called enlightenment. And it's every human being's birthright to one day enjoy supreme enlightenment, which is total fulfillment, total liberation, a state described as more than the most. And on the way to enlightenment, life gets better and better and better. So that's my little drawing. Hi, Mr. Lynch. Hello. Um, very nice to meet you. Um, I wanted to ask you two questions, if that's possible. Uh, first one, um, as a person, as a student of um, audiovisual communication and also as a person who's fond of um, meditation and authors that talk about it like Eckhart Tolle or Michael Brown, for example. I would like to know how has, uh, in a practical way, transcendental meditation changed the way you create your creative process? I sort of answered that. Um, I was creative before I started. Um, so I think what it does is human beings want more and more and more. And one of the things I wanted, um, I, I thought about with Transcendental Meditation is a lot of um, filmmakers or artists, um, they, they maybe make the same film over and over again. And I wanted to see if I could grow in between these films. And this thing about transcending every day and expanding that consciousness, I thought maybe it gives me a chance to grow and find you know, more and more and more in the cinema, more and more and more in the painting. And also, when you're unsure of yourself and you're filled with anxieties and you feel um, it's just, it's so much better to feel more self-assured and stronger inside yourself. It's very, very good for the creative process. When you dive into the big ocean of pure creativity, unbounded create, you're bound to get more of that. And you're bound to get more intuition. And this thing of intuition, like I said, is seeing something isn't correct, and lo and behold, seeing a way to make it correct, finding solutions to problems. And, and it's, it's all there and, and, it, and it comes out. The biggest thing is the happiness in, in the doing. So many of us work and we don't enjoy the moments going by and, and we are working just for money. But if you can enjoy the work and get the money, it's better. Um, my other question is, uh, why cinema? I mean, I know uh, you are not only a cinema artist, but you also paint and do other things. Why? Uh, how can you decide? I mean, it's like religion. The, they are all united by the same thing, but you, you know, people choose one. Why, why did you choose this one? I, I didn't really choose it. It sort of chose me. Um, but you go where the ideas go. Somewhere along the line, I, I told this story a bunch, I was painting, a, I just wanted to be a painter. I was painting a picture in a studio at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. I paint this picture of mostly black with 
green garden in the, in the painting, and I'm sitting there, not taking drugs, and the painting started to move. And I hear a wind coming from the painting. So I said, oh, a moving painting. And that's what started me making films. But you have, there's so many ideas. There's ideas for surfers. There's ideas for business you know, people. There's ideas for um, musicians. There's ideas for everyone coming all the time. And um, so if you get an idea for a piece of furniture, you see that piece of furniture suddenly in your head. And you see what it's made of, you see the shape of it, and if you love that, you, you do a little drawing of it and write down the materials that you see, and then you go in the shop and you build it. If you get a cinema idea, you, you know it when it comes. So you go where the ideas tell you. Please, please, Vicente, wait. Uh, we're going to uh, ask the last two questions. And uh, please, and Mr. Lynch is going to finish. So uh, I ask all of you, please sit. Don't wake up when he finished. Don't wake up? Don't, <laughs> don't, sorry, don't stand up. Sorry, my nervous. Don't stand up. Uh, I'll make these answers very Sorry. boring, and then you'll go to sleep. Don't stand up <laughs> while Mr. Lynch is leaving the room, okay? And we say he will buy clapping our hands. But please, the last two questions. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, first of all. Stand, stand, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Mr. Lynch, for coming here. It's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I, I would like to know your opinion about if we, it, it's a must to develop our inner creativity, like we have to develop it uh, like strongly, or we just have to rely on it, um, uh, trust our creativity and just go ahead with it. You just trust your creativity. Trust your creativity, start your transcendental meditation, and you'll just get more of that creativity to trust. You really have to trust yourself. Another name for this deepest level of life, I didn't tell you all these things. This deepest level of life in Vedic language is called Atma. Atma, meaning the self. The self with a capital S. Know thyself, we've all heard this line. This is the self they're talking about within each one of us. Another name is Brahm. Huh? Oh, another name is Brahm, meaning totality. Another name for this deepest level of life is the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. In the Bible it says, first seek the kingdom of heaven which lies within and all else will be added unto you. All else is totality. It's there for us. All these things that we're looking for, the real secret is they lie within. It's a field of being. The source the reality, constitution of the universe, home of total knowledge, home of all the laws of nature. This field will do it for you. You just need a technique to get you there. There's lots of forms of meditation and now there's been so much research that they see what these different meditations are doing. In brain research, they see when a person truly transcends, if they're hooked to the EEG machine, they see a most wondrous thing. The full brain lights up on the EEG machine. Transcending is the only experience in life that does that. Any other thing we do, we play the piano, we use just one little small part of the brain. You do a painting, another little small part. You do physics, another little small part. And they always told us we only use five or 10% of our brain. 
Here's an experience that utilizes the full brain, total brain coherence. And the more you transcend, the more that coherence stays. And this gives rise to higher states of consciousness, which is our birthright to experience. Waking, sleeping, and dreaming are three states of consciousness. When you transcend, the nervous system works in a fourth unique way, fourth state of consciousness. And this becomes permanent, it's another state of consciousness, and there's two more states above that, available for the human being. So much is there, and the, the, the education should unfold the student's full potential. Education today just gives us facts and figures helps us get a job. So you go from the stress of school to the stress of work, you become a slave to the boss, and um, it's, it's a kind of a sadness. The trick is, experience this field, and it doesn't really matter what's happening out in the world, you're gonna get more and more powerful, more and more creative, creative and much more happy. And you're gonna find solutions to things. And these solutions are gonna lead to a, a great world coming soon. The key to peace is here. So get with the program and um, we'll, we'll all start really enjoying life. Buenos días. Buenos días. Me llamo Carlos, soy profesor. Entonces quería preguntarle, para una persona, un jardinero, regala raíz es algo fundamental para vivar todo el pleno potencial de su árbol. ¿Usted cree que para una universidad es imprescindible o es muy importante incorporar la meditación trascendental en el proceso educativo? Okay, I'm going to try and translate this. Um, he said, um, well, he's Carlos, a uh, lecturer in this university. He says that for the gardener to water the root of a plant is essential. Do you think that's as essential as for a university to incorporate uh, transcendental med uh, meditation? Absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. I'll tell you, it was just a, uh, a story. Um, in San Francisco, in San Francisco, there was a school, a middle school, that had, um, it was the worst school in the city. There were murders in the neighborhood. Inside the school, there were fights all the time, and at least one fight a week that brought an ambulance and the police. There was terrible grades, terrible relationships, students filled with torment inside, and uh, teachers with teacher burnout. A very, very bad situation, but not unlike a lot of schools all around the world. The principal, Mr. Jim Durkee, tried so many things for his school and none of them were working. He heard about this transcendental meditation and he looked into it. By now there are six or seven hundred research studies showing this hundreds, so myriad of benefits from this, uh, this field is where it's happened. Transcendental meditation is just a key that opens the door to this field. This field is the thing that does it for the human being. So he looked into transcendental meditation and he said, it's, and this guy is not like a hippie. He's not a, a goofball, he's a good old boy. The last kind of guy you'd think he would go for meditation. And he said, but let's, as strange as it sounds, let's try it. And he fought for it and he got it for the students, the teachers, the staff, and the principal himself. And within one year, this school went 180 degrees. The fighting stopped. The students got so happy. The teachers said, oh, the students are able to focus. Grades went up. The teachers got happy. They started enjoying teaching again. In the halls of the school, a thick happiness. It, it was a transformation that was phenomenal and so beautiful. And now uh, those same students are talking to other students, those same teachers are talking to other teachers, the principal is talking to other principals. There's four or five schools now that have it for all the school, and there's um, 16 schools in San Francisco waiting for, on the waiting list. The 
hierarchy of the San Francisco Unified School District, they are all med meditating, and the, the superintendent um, the, is a new one now, he's meditating, and the previous superintendent uh, was uh, meditating. They had a control group because they have some of the best research in the country, and they had half the hierarchy of the uh, school district not meditating, half of them they gave transcendental meditation, and within two weeks, the ones that didn't have it wanted it, and they kind of folded up the research. So it's, it's a real thing. It's a profoundly beautiful thing for the human being. And if schools had it, if this university had it, it would go something like um, you would, you, and, and, and it, in a group, it's even more powerful. So you could come to this university and have a time to meditate in the morning, and then at the end of the day, have a time to meditate uh, and, and go about your business. You add this to whatever you're doing, and it will jump things profoundly. It's money in the bank to dive within and transcend. Um, hola. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Lynch. My question was, at the end of the Elephant Man, there is like a voiceover which says, if I remember, like, nothing dies. Um, in my opinion, um, obscure and pessimist movie turns into a more optimist movie in that point. So my question is, what were you talking about in that point? Is that the, the consciousness you, you said before, or the, it's just the, the medium uh, which is changing, but the core or the driver, uh, as you said before, is staying the same, or like the, we, we have seen a, a body which is different from the rest of the of the people, but the consciousness is like in another level. So, can you explain more or less? Sure, sure. I don't really talk about uh, those things too much, but the Elephant Man had a body, uh, like you say, different from others. But the Elephant Man uh, was a human being, and a human being is a humanoid reflecting the being. This is the being which we all have. And um, just because the elephant man dropped his body, uh, this thing of nothing will die is a true thing. Consciousness is a continuum. Things change, but consciousness will always remain. They say you always will be you. Always will be you, inside the car or outside the car. Just the thing is that the you that you truly are is unbounded totality. And the trick of us human beings is unfolding the truth of what we really are. Okay. So, Mr. Lynch, so I think we now finish. Thank you all so very much. Thank you very much. I have to. I have. Um, I have. To, I have to say this poem before I leave, and this poem is of unknown origin, and it goes like this: May everyone be happy. May everyone be free of disease. May auspiciousness be seen everywhere. May suffering belong to no one. Peace. Thank you guys.